Earlier, Keith visited Professor Cole Murray at Queen Mary University of London to find out the latest results from the Cassini probe. 2009 is going to be an important year for Saturn observers. Every 15 or so years, halfway through its 29-year orbit around the Sun, Saturn's rings between, begin to close up and move edge on with respect to the Earth. And this is called the Saturn ring plane crossing. Now the next one is going to happen on the 10th of August 2009, but unfortunately for us, Saturn is going to be around the back of the Sun at the time and we're not going to be able to see it from Earth. The only way we could see it is if we had a handy spacecraft in orbit around Saturn. Unfortunately for us, we do. The Cassini spacecraft blasted off from Cape Canaveral in 1997 and arrived at Saturn in the summer of 2004. In the last four years, it has been observing the planet, its rings and myriad magical moons, its cameras guided by a team of scientists back on Earth. I sat down with Professor Carl Murray, one of the imaging team scientists, to discuss the upcoming ring plane crossing. The rings of Saturn are essentially particles of ice uh, that we've known that for a long time. They're not solid. They're all tiny little bits of ice in orbit around the planet, almost like miniature moons or snowballs in, in themselves. Um, we don't really know. It's one of the things Cassini wants to solve is how the rings formed. Uh, there's a few theories. One is you've got a passing giant comet that uh, either got disrupted um, by giant, I mean not the sort of Halley-sized comet, but something hundreds of kilometres across, that got disrupted by the planet, and similar to the way Shoemaker-Levy 9 was disrupted by Jupiter. Um, and then perhaps formed the ring system, because we know the rings are icy and comets are icy bodies. Uh, or perhaps the comet hit one of the icy moons of Saturn and caused it to break up. Um, or perhaps the, the moon was, uh, there was a moon that was spiralling in towards the planet and just got tidally disrupted. So. Those are kind of the general theories, and they all have their, their pros and cons. But one of the things we're trying to do with Cassini is tr try and put, put limits on that and figure out which theory is correct. Well, the question of the age of the rings is something we're trying to solve again with Cassini. What we thought after the Voyager encounters, all, all we understood about the ring system suggested that their age was about 200 million years old at, at the most. And the problem was that we figured that the ring should be collapsing and that that whole process would take about 100, 200 million years and therefore why should we be around, um, you know, we're, we shouldn't put ourselves at a special point in time. Now, what we're, what we're finding with, with Cassini, uh, or at least one interpretation of what we're finding is first of all that the rings are more massive. I think that, that goes without saying. We've now discovered that there are structures within the rings. We haven't actually seen them, but they've been inferred now, and there's good evidence for them. These sort of temporary uh, agglomerations, if you like, of, of the, the ring particles, they're forming sort of 100 meter long, um, sort of cigar shaped objects that are slightly tilted, and these explain various properties we see in the rings. So that puts a lot more mass that we wouldn't have expected in the rings. And that's led some people to conclude that the rings are essentially could have been around since the formation of the solar system and that that the ring material has actually been, been accreting and then breaking up again and accreting and breaking up and in between time you've still had bombardment from outside that's causing other structures in the, in the rings. So, so the, the minute we've got one extreme sort of 100 million years and the other extreme you know 4.6 billion years and uh, it'd be nice to to actually still put some some real numbers on those and we can we think we may be able to still do that with Cassini. What's going to happen when we have the ring plane crossing is that the, uh, we'll have the sun in the, the ring plane. Now what that actually means for us in terms of viewing geometry is that we'll get shadows. And shadows are brilliant because they tell you something, they can, you can look at it two ways. They can tell us about objects that are embedded in the rings because they will suddenly cast a shadow which, which we can see across the rings, but it's actually the shadow itself and how it behaves, if you like, its ups and downs, will tell us about the, the ring structure itself. So we, by f we can find embedded objects, but we can also find out things about the vertical structure in, in the rings. And so, for example, we believe that some of the moons, which are in slightly inclined to the, the equator, their gravitational effect causes a warping in, in the ring plane. And to actually measure the heights of those sort of corrugations would be would be really useful because that will help us to confirm the information we think we, we have about the, the ring properties themselves. 
the biggest discoveries, uh, there's, there's quite a few, but um, one is that the mass is a lot bigger than we thought it was, and that's coming from these, the, the occultation data. Um, another is that the small moons that are orbiting just outside the rings we're now finding one after another. These are ones that either we knew about from, from Voyager or ground-based observations or the Cassini has discovered. One by one, we're seeing that they're associated with rings themselves. And the origin of these is almost certainly bombardment, materials coming from outside, impacting the object. Um, and then clouds of material are coming off and they're staying more or less close to the, to the, the moon itself and then sort of drifting, drifting away. And we're seeing in particular cases arcs of material with the satellite kind of embedded in the, in the arc, um, in other cases complete rings, and we think we understand that as well, and this phenomenon of resonance is, is probably responsible for that. So I think that's a major discovery. M my real interest is in the F ring, which is a sort of tw twisted, braided ring right just outside the main ring system, and that's always been a puzzle light from the Voyager observations, and I think one of the major breakthroughs um, as far as I'm concerned with that, is understanding, seeing the direct evidence for a whole moonlit belt that's associated with, with that ring. And it's just like unlike any other ring in the solar system. And we see, you know, you kind of think of Saturn's rings as, okay, you see a different viewing geometry as a viewing from Earth, but you kind of assume they're constant. But in the F ring, things change on time scales ranging from hours to, to decades. And with a mission like Cassini, we can actually see all that happening and formulate our theories and not, we'll make real progress to understand. Seeing, seeing these things happening and collisions that are happening on you know, an almost weekly or monthly basis and we're seeing the effects of those collisions and how that dust and debris that's produced changes with time and then gets influenced by other little moons that are around there. And even though we can't even resolve a lot of these features, these little moons, we kind of know they're there and uh, we're able to study them and try and get um, you know, trying to understand where they come from. Because the F ring is in this weird region between where we, particles, it's called the Roche limit, where particles, self-gravity is, is trying to keep them together, but at the same time the tidal forces are so strong because they're so close to the planet, it's pulling them apart. So you may get temporary things formed that then kind of disrupt again and then reform and disrupt again and again. So it's a really interesting region. The rings of Saturn are important to, to study because it's actually the only example of a disk that we've got in our neighborhood. You know, we can see disks around um, other stars. And we, they're almost as certainly associated with planets. But this is like a miniature solar system. Um, this is a means of studying the processes that go on in the early solar system when the sun had its own disk out of which the planets formed. Okay, the, the conditions are a bit different. The orbits here are near circular and the kind of masses are different, but the physical processes are the same. And I think it's indicative of that that one of the things we've seen in the rings, uh, we see these things called propellers where you've got um, embedded objects which are maybe a few hundred meters across and they're gravitationally affecting the material around them to form these sort of little offset things called, called propellers. And, you know, I've got colleagues here at Queen Mary who do numerical simulations of planets forming and you see exactly this same process um, on a completely different scale, but it's the same physical process. And yet here, we're not talking about modeling, we're actually talking about seeing these things in front of us and tracking these objects as, as they move around. And we've got a few dozen of these and finding more all the, all the time. So that's just one example, but we've got a disk in our, in our backyard that, that we can study um, for, for years and see how things evolve. And that, that's really important, because if we can understand that, we're not going to have much chance of understanding sort of the bigger scale processes.